if he stays in the crimson and cream his whole tenure, who knows what would have happened, right? I, I personally think it was a detriment for him to go out to USC just with, you know, he just had a lack of, of foundation out there. Lincoln's trying to become the new head guy. It's the West Coast. You're having to, you know, try and fit in, so on and so forth. So I think that was somewhat of a detriment to him. However, obviously played some great football. They didn't, they weren't as successful as he or they wanted to be during his tenure there, but he, he showed all the attributes that uh, could potentially land him a massive, you know, rookie deal here in, in the coming weeks. <laughs> College football tees, college basketball tees, whatever you need, Mercury has you covered with the best merch out there. We're talking about high quality clothing, inexpensive, and the best part is I have a 15% discount for everybody who goes and gets some right now. Use the code below, hit the link in the description, and go get your merch now. Use the code to get 15% off. What are you waiting on? Go do it. Welcome to another episode of the Dial It Up podcast with Trevor Knight. And officially today, it is now the Dial It Up podcast with Trevor and Connor Knight, my esteemed co-host, my twin brother. I was number nine on the field. Connor was number 89, sporting the crimson and cream. And I'm pumped to be able to do this week in, week out with my brother, but also another Sooner great um, who shared all the mem- memories, all the moments um, in our four, four and a half, five years for you in Norman. And um, with that, Connor, how are we doing today, man? How's the week going? Spring ball's underway, so a lot of fun stuff to talk about uh, with the boys up in Norman. Doing good, man. I mean, severe weather rolling through Texas and Oklahoma last night, so it's got to be springtime, right? I mean, it's, it's got to be springtime. And absolutely, speaking of crazy weather in, in Norman, Oklahoma, man, I, we probably talked about it on our segment together, but it's different. If you don't grow up in the part of the world or the part of the country where you've got tornadoes um, that are coming pretty close to you pretty often, you just don't understand. And I know that's how we were growing up in San Antonio, but t- tell a quick story and then we'll get rocking and rolling of um, when we had, I think it was an F4 that was going through more just north of Norman. And um, and we were on our at our neighbor's house. Tell that, that story real quick. Yeah. So we lived... Um off of Barry and Ann Arbor, lived on Ann Arbor, um, over pretty close to, uh, to Norman high. Um, and we didn't have a basement in our house. We had about six of us living there. Um, but our neighbors did, and we became really good friends with a bunch of families on the street. And so, you know, anytime, um, you know, news four popped up or whatever, and they started getting after it, we would go down to their house and play wiffle ball in the backyard until, uh, till the sirens started going off and then, you know, head inside or not. Um, but yeah, it, it really is something you don't know, or you just don't know how to, how to take it. I think the first time one of those storms rolled through, I was tucked down in the basement, you know, when they issued the warning and, or issued the watch. And you, I guess everyone in Oklahoma knows it's not, it's not serious until the warning goes out and then it's not even serious. Then people are outside drinking beers and, you know, watching those funnel clouds roll by like it's nothing. Yeah, we used to always go down to the neighbor's house, uh, the Lynx, shout out to the Lynx, um, and and use their basement if things got rough. Yeah, no doubt. I saw a, um, a, a video, I think it was on Instagram today, of a guy wearing his OU robe. He was sitting in a lawn chair with, with the Dos Equis in his hand, and there's literally a tornado over his shoulder. And it's like when naders are on the way, you know, I, I don't chase naders much, but when I do, I drink those Secchies. He's just chilling there. So definitely a different type of world. But, guys, another episode. Uh, make sure always follow us along um, wherever you listen to your podcast. Subscribe on YouTube um, or, or uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And then interact with us on social media. Um, at Red Dirt Media Co. Uh, is where you can find us the best. There's a couple other podcasts on there, so inter- interact with those. Uh, I know uh, Caden Helms and, and Nick Anderson do a phenomenal job on there. So uh, go listen to their podcast as well. But we'll be rolling every week. Uh, like we mentioned, obviously getting in the spring ball here will be fun. But once the season starts, buckle up because here we go. 
And so for the next couple of weeks, uh, we will sprinkle in some thoughts on, on spring ball and how that's going. But we want to go position by position uh, and talk really high level, um, not necessarily drilling down into our current roster, although we will touch on that, but more so, what does it take to be great at that position? What are you looking for? Historically, with guys in the crimson and cream, what attributes have they had that, uh, that allowed them to be successful and go on and do great things, uh, both in Norman and beyond? And so today, we're going to dive into the quarterbacks. Obviously, that's, that's where a lot of people would start. That's where we're going to start. I've got, obviously, some really good experience there because I played the position and I was around some great guys. But, Connor, you've got some great uh, perspective there as well because you didn't play the position, but you were also around those guys. So you can see it from a different perspective. So excited to dive into that today. But before we do, spring ball has begun in Norman. The guys are battling it out. Connor, what does spring ball mean, right? I mean, I know it's – it's the off season. There's some hype, especially around the spring game. But what is it? Uh, how is it beneficial for the guys in that locker room and the coaching staff as you know they move into the summer and then eventually into the, the fall? You know, it's kind of a a no stress. I I say that um, not actually meaning no stress because it's pretty intense. But no stress as far as you're not going to have a game on Saturday. You don't have a game for probably 20 Saturdays. So there's no pressure of getting ready for a game. It's really the time, you know, guys just finished up the season. They know where they were at the the season before. Um, Guys have graduated, gone on to the NFL, gone on, just graduated in general. So it's it's guys, you know, looking to make their mark um, to, you know, solidify a role going into the summer, going into spring ball, um, a chance for them to show out. Um, and prove to the coaches and to their teammates, you know, what they can do. And it's really a, it's an interesting time um, because I know, it, I assume it's still that way, but we always took our biggest course load in the spring. Um, so, you know, you're taking more hours than you usually did uh, during the season. So more school, but you're still focused on football a little bit, but you're still focused on school. So it's kind of a juggling act there, you know, when spring ball starts, but it's really, um, you know, when, when practice, I, I guess practices are a couple times a week when it's time to practice, it's time to go. And you got to, you know, be able to flip that switch between, um, you know, it's spring, it doesn't really matter. And Hey, we got to get ready to go. We got to, you know, um, in this case, probably learn a little bit of a new offense and new defense um, for the guys this year. um, And then show what I can do out there. Um, Go try and earn a spot, go try and make plays um, when the time comes. Um, I know you, you went third at OU. You went third at A&M. Just talk a little bit about your springs, because I know yours is probably a little bit different than, you know, the quarterbacks um, this year. Jackson seems to be kind of submitted as the guy. I don't know if they're treating it as an open competition. Coaches usually say that just to, you know, kind of bring the competitive juices out. But talk about kind of your springs and the mentality you took into those um, and kind of some of the individual spring balls that uh, that you went through. Yeah, you know, I – I think that there's a different mentality for guys at different stages of their career. Um, Obviously, as a young guy, you're out there and you're scratching and clawing. I mean, you're almost trying to be perfect, which can be a detriment because then you don't play. You're playing uptight, right? You don't play your best ball, but you're trying to earn your spot. And so my first spring ball is battling it out with Kendall Thompson and Blake Bell. And man, it was just a grind mentally. Um, you know, you didn't want to mess up. So you had all this pressure on you, but you knew it wasn't season time. So, you know, you wanted to leave a great first impression on, on the coaching staff. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, you, you couldn't go out there and, and improve yourself on Saturday. So that one was just stressful. And I think it is for, for all the young guys. The next one after that, because I had started that season, was really my only spring ball where I wasn't necessarily looking over my shoulder. We went and won the the Sugar Bowl, and then Blake decided to move to tight end. And so it was really – I knew I was going to be the guy going to the next season. Now, Baker had transferred in that offseason, and and he was participating in spring ball with us, and he was tearing it up. Um, And and so had Baker not had to sit out that next year, it would have been another incredibly stressful spring ball because him and I would have been battling it out, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, so that was a unique one. I felt like there uh, there were times where I was being outplayed, um, you know, by Bake when you know I knew I was going to be the guy. So um, a little bit better because I felt like I had to work on myself as opposed to really just try and battle every day. But um, but but certainly not stress free. And then the next year, you know, it was Bake and I battling it out, and and very stressful in terms of again just trying to fight for your job. At this point, though, I, I understood how it worked, right? I, I had played a lot of ball. I was working on myself, but I was also battling it out with another guy. So it was a lot of fun. I'd say that was a, a, a very fun spring. And then finally, my last spring down in College Station, um, I got named the starter the Monday after spring ball. And that at that point, yeah, it was stressful because I was battling it out with somebody else. But I was just having fun, man. It was like it was a breath of fresh air, you know. I I I had moved schools, which was a lot. I was trying to solidify solidify myself as a leader, but um, it was. I just knew, man. I got one year left to play college football. I'm gonna have as much fun as I possibly can, and and I think I played my best ball that spring. So very unique as, as it comes to that. But uh, man, it is an opportunity to get on the coach's good side to. To, to set the tone for the upcoming season. And I know one of the quarterbacks on this roster is certainly doing that. He got to dip his toe uh, in, in a starting role in, in the Alamo Bowl, which we'll get to in Jackson Arnold. Um, but we'll talk about him last in terms of these QBs. So let's, let's dive in, Con. Quarterback, the position. One of the most positions, uh, important positions in, in all of sports, just from a cognitive standpoint. An athleticism standpoint, and then just being a distributor of the football, being a leader, all, all those different things. Uh, I think it's such a unique position, and I'm obviously biased because I played it, but it's it's an incredibly hard position because there's so much going on. You got to know everybody, what everybody's doing on the field at all times. You got to be cool, calm, and collected, and you also got to have a little grit to you and be tough and be a playmaker. So um, there's been some phenomenal ones that have worn the crimson and cream. We would call Oklahoma QBU, um, right, especially here in the last decade or two where we've had multiple Heisman Trophy winners and, and that position group has played at a very high level. I'm happy to uh, announce that I was a part of that group. I feel like if you came within arm's distance of me, you won the Heisman Trophy. I just never got to win the Heisman Trophy. <laughs> so talk, talk a little bit uh, before we get into individual players, Con, just from your seat not being a quarterback, what are a couple of those attributes that you see that makes a quarterback not only good but great? I think it starts, you know, in the locker room. Um, every good quarterback that I've played with, guys on the team just kind of gravitate towards them. They all – they seem to be, you know, mostly universally liked. Um, guys like to be around them. Um, and, you know, that's where it starts when you get the respect to your teammates. Um, and then that translates over to the practice field, to the game field, when they're going to go out and, and try and do everything they can to, one, make you look good, make themselves look good. But that, in turn, makes makes you as a quarterback look good. Um, then it's, you know, the on the field, the the leadership. You know, are they getting too high when things get good? Are they getting too low when things get bad? You know, you, we go back to – to high school, staying even keel, staying even keel is what our high school coach used to always tell us. But, you know, that's kind of what you want to see out of those guys. You, you obviously want to see them get hyped up when things get good because um, it's fun to celebrate and do all that. And it's fun to see, you know, kind of the leader of the offense um, get juiced up and hyped up. Then, you know, when, when, a, when there's a bad day, when um, things aren't going their way, maybe a bad week, especially in spring ball, you, know, you, you kind of look to them and see how they're going to respond. Cause, the end of the day, the quarterback's going to kind of set the set the mood, set the energy for the offense every day. I mean, I know in spring ball that was always a big deal. Um, you know, you got to you got to come every day like you want to be there and like you're trying to get better. Because then, if you're if you're out there just going through the motions, nobody's getting better. The coaches start getting upset. Um, you start running all those things. You know, so you know, locker room and then how that translates over to the game field is what you're looking for. So it's basically just how those guys are able to lead on and off the field that everybody's kind of looking to 
Um, and everybody's trying to gravitate to a certain guy in that situation. I agree there. I, I think that any, any leader, not even just a quarterback, but any leader of an organization, which you do look at the quarterback position of being that, you, you have to have false energy sometimes. You touched on it. I remember, you know, Coach Heupel and Josh Heupel and, and Lincoln Riley were always, always talking to us about having the most energy on the field. And let's be honest, some days you just don't want to have energy, right? There are days you just want to go out there and you want to go through the motions. And it's tough to have that, you know, uh, uh, false energy, right, to, to go out there and, and be the guy, but you got to do it. and um, you, you also mentioned, you know, just guys gravitating towards you. Some of that you can teach. Uh, 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 some of that you can't, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just have to have it. And with our first quarterback here that I want to talk about, you know, in recent history, Baker had that, man. I mean, the guy, the moment he stepped foot on campus, he was a, a former walk-on. Now he had, you know, won some awards at Tech, and so we knew he could play, but Man, the guy just stepped in the locker room and was like, Man, I just I want to be a better player. And I'm saying that for myself, but also everybody in, in the locker room. You just knew, like, man, I could I could go to battle with this guy. I, I could really go and, and stick my neck out there and give it my all for this guy, and I want to. So why don't you start? Talk a little bit about Baker, his quarterback style, what made him great. Um, and then even if you want to go through, you know, a, a couple of games or, or you just you run, you run with Baker and then I'll take Kyler next. But run with Baker and what made him a, a great quarterback? Like you said, when he first got to OU, um, we were all, you know, trying to find him. He was living over in the dorms. And we're like, man, we want to be friends with this guy. You know, went in, started as a true freshman, walk on at Tech, won a bunch of games, threw for a bunch of yards, didn't work out there. We got none of us knew the reason why he left. We were kind of trying to figure that out in the first place. Like, why is this guy even here? And then we started hanging out with him. And, and like you said, just an awesome dude that you want to be around, you want to hang out with. Um, and then, you know, as, as he takes over the starting job and all that um, kind of the, the first big memories, you know, us at, I know we talked about, everyone seems to talk about that Tennessee game that was there. Um, but it was this coming out party and it kind of embodies who he was as a quarterback. You know, things weren't going good for three and a half quarters. And then he just turns into Baker at the end and he, you know, gunslinger, um, fearless. I mean, uh, pulling the ball on a fourth and one when he could have given it to our 240 pound running back to try and bust it in there. I mean, the guy just, he has some stones on him. And I think every place that he's been, um, in the league, you know, every locker room that he goes to, you hear it from the from the media. All the players are saying this guy's just an incredible leader. It's a guy that, you know, people want to go fight for. Um, it's a guy that people want to play with. And every place that he's gone, you know, he's earned a starting spot or um, now earned a big contract. It's it's kind of the it goes back to exactly what you said people gravitate towards him, you know, as a his quarterback style, I mean, he, kid's a gunslinger and, and he's fearless. Um, you know, I, I can't go into the, the, the weeds on, you know, this and that and, you know, technique and all those things. But um, the, the dude's just a winner. He, he was a winner in high school. He was a winner in college. He, he has been a winner in the pros um, at a bunch of places he's gone to. So it's, I mean, it's been fun to watch his career maturation, but, you know, getting to kind of be in it when he was, you know, trying to figure it out at OU too. That was a lot of fun. Um, and just to, I'm really happy I got to play with him because, you know, one of the best that he'll, you know, college football Hall of Famer without a doubt um, at some point, Heisman Trophy winner, um, and a guy that, guy that can play some dang football. No doubt. I, I think that you touched on a lot of points about Bake that were really good in terms of the X's and O's. The, the guy has a really, really good arm. He's incredibly accurate. Um, and, and on top of that, he has great feel, too. Great pocket presence. Um, he's able to put touch on the ball when, when need be and just get the ball in the playmaker's hands. He's got a little grit to him as well. Now, I mean, he'll put his shoulder down. 
he did it this this past year in Tampa. Put his, put his shoulder down and try and put it right through somebody. Um, so really good player. Baker, certainly a, a, a Hall of Famer someday in, in college football um, and one that both of us were lucky to be around who embodied a lot of traits that what that, that is what make what you have to have to make you a, a phenomenal quarterback. Let me dive into Kyler real quick, Tom. Kyler was very different than Baker, right? Um, Kyler started out at AM, and again, you come within an arm's length of me, then uh, you're going to win the Heisman. So Kyler and I effectively switched when I, when I transferred down there. And uh, he comes in and he gets to sit behind Baker for a year, which I think was great for him to just watch such a great leader and a locker room guy um, for a year. But Kyler was a, a lot more subdued from, from what I hear, right? He, um, he stayed in his lane. He was a good leader, but he wasn't necessarily the rah-rah guy, excuse me, that, that Baker was, which is okay. Um, and I think giving Lincoln Riley some credit here, Lincoln did such a great job managing both of their personalities to get the most out of them on the field. Because Kyler steps in, he's got one year, and he goes out after a historic year by Bake and, and tops it. I mean, just plays absolutely flawless football. And what some of the attributes that I think that Kyler had um, that, that made him great is, number one, he, he was a competitor. And the guy, whether it was on the baseball field or the football field, um, he, he's always been a competitor. Uh, the, one of the winningest, if not the most winning high school quarterback of all time, uh, m- arguably the best high school quarterback at all time um, out of Allen, Texas, but also obviously gets drafted in the first round by the Oakland A's uh, his junior year, I believe it was. And, and uh, man, the, the guy's just a freak athlete. So he is an ultimate competitor, but where Baker maybe, you know, made up for some lack of athleticism um, with, with grit and determination, Kyler didn't need to. He was fast. He was shifty. He could make plays with his feet. But something that it took a little while for people to figure out was the guy has a cannon of an arm. And the way he throws the football is unlike anybody I've ever seen. And and I'll I'll give you guys an example. Um, I was talking to Christian Kirk. Uh, Christian Kirk played wide receiver at A&M. Um, when Kyler was there and then also played with Kyler for the Arizona Cardinals uh, when they played together out there. Christian Kirk is a uh, wide receiver for the Jacksonville Jaguars now and, and somebody I would consider a, a, not only a great friend, but a, a phenomenal professional. And uh, so I was asking him one time, I was like, hey, what, what makes Kyler different? And he goes, man, that dude throws the softest ball I've ever caught in my life. And what that means is it's a softball or a catchable ball. Like when I throw the ball and I'm throwing a slant route and I'm trying to fit it in there, I throw it with so much velocity and it's, it's a hard ball, right? I mean, it, it hits your hands and you got to, you got to catch it. Kyler was able to put enough zip on the ball, but it still was like butter and he would put it right on the money. He was deadly accurate. And I thought that was just a, a unique thing to say from a receiver about the way that a guy threw the football. And it, and it, it, it showed up. I mean, the, the production that he got out of some of those receivers, and he had some great receivers, but the guy was just deadly accurate. Um, I think he also had this, this confidence about him, which I know that's one of my points that I'll get to at the end. That all quarterbacks that are great have a – just a, a, a ridiculous level of confidence. And Kyler was ultra confident in himself every single week when he went out there on the field. He had a lot to prove. He was a big time five star recruit that things didn't go his way. And then he got a shot and he ran with it. So Kyler is certainly one of the best to wear the crimson and cream. Um, kind of the, the, the next, um, uh, and the next guy on the list, Con, that I want you to talk about. Uh, the three-headed monster with Baker, Kyler, and, and now Jalen Hurts. Another transfer that comes in and plays incredible ball for, for the Sooners. Talk a little bit about Jalen from what you've heard about him, what you know about him, and what you've watched. 
that makes him uh, who he is and why he's great, Tom. Yeah, I haven't been able to, you know, spend any time around Jalen, but, um, you know, one of the big things that sticks out, every big game you see him in, you you couldn't tell if he just threw for 500 yards or just threw five interceptions when they put the camera on him. I mean, the dude is always stone-faced. He, the I definition mean, of even keel, right? He'd wait. I mean, just – just cool and collected. I mean, I just think to the um, the Baylor OU game at Baylor when OU's down big, claws back, and you know we get that interception to end the game, and the camera goes to Jalen, and he's just turned around looking at the stands, just straight face, not you know cheering, not smiling, anything, just straight face, staring everybody down. It's yeah. it, the dude just seems like a stone cold killer, and on top of that. Dude throws one of the best deep balls I've ever seen. I mean, talk nice. about catchable balls. He he can he can lay it out there and let you know guys run under it. it he has you know AJ Brown, Devontae Smith. Those guys can scoot a little bit, and it, with the Eagles, that dude can just lay it out there. And it seems like guys are always running running under it in stride. Um, he just seems like um, from the just not knowing him, you'd look and think, oh no, that guy's not you know he's not a vocal leader. Um, you know, maybe not, he's not a rah-rah guy, he, but from what we've heard or from what I've heard, he was a fantastic leader. He was all about business. He was unbelievably prepared every time he stepped foot on the field, uh, and is to this day, um, and just, a, a f- following up back-to-back Heisman Trophy winners, you never want to be the guy after the guy. You definitely don't want to be the guy after the guy after the guy. So, I mean, he came in. Led OU to another college football playoff. Um, I think second in the Heisman race. Um, so the dude can just flat out ball. And I mean, his his bank account is proof of that at this point, you know, making it to a Super Bowl. I think those first three guys we talked about, they all, I, I think I talked about that with um, Jay Hall on. Those guys got a little coin in the pocket. Um, but yeah, no Jalen Hurts, just a, just a freak. Freak. And, and, you know, talking to some of the guys on on the, on the staff when Jalen came in, it was like a lot of times you have to pull guys up into preparation mentality, you know, buy in all those things. They were trying to subdue him just a bit. It was like it was almost as though he cared too much. That was and that was a detriment to him. You mentioned it always in the weight room. Stone cold, watching at your extra film, and the I mean the guy was an over preparer, and he obviously figured out how to manage that because I think he's the guy that has just gotten better and better and better and better, and and he's overcome adversity. I think that's another big you know if you want to kind of list these things out, what makes a quarterback great? Overcoming adversity, you know, next play mentality. Um, Jalen goes to Alabama, plays really well in a lot of games, wins a ton of games, and then the Tua show comes in, and he has to, you know, swallow his pride and um, and transfer out to Oklahoma, and like you said, follow up a couple guys that just won Heisman trophies, and he stepped into that role, believed in himself, and and just did a phenomenal job. So I'm a huge Jalen fan. Shout out to Nicole Lynn, his agent, who got him that contract. <laughs> Nicole's husband Gabe played with us at OU so there's a lot of sooner connections you know rolling through that relationship so big time by Jalen let's let's go through the next couple here relatively quickly I do want to touch on them but I do want to save a little bit of time for Jackson Arnold um so after Jalen came Spencer for a year and then also Spencer Caleb so let's loop that into one Talk a little bit about Spencer and what makes him great. And then obviously Caleb, even though he transferred out and, um, you know, presumably potentially the number one pick here in just a few weeks. Um, talk about those two guys, Con. Yeah, Spencer, again, another guy that I haven't spent any time around, but just seems like just arm strength is freaky. Just arm talent is freaky. Um I think we talked about it with Jeremiah came in, um, got handed the reins very early on and may not have been ready for that type of responsibility quite yet. But, you know, um, ends up transferring to South Carolina, grows up a bunch, um, plays a lot of really good football and puts himself in a good position um, 
you know, going into the draft. Um, but a guy, I mean, he, he wasn't bad. I mean, it was kind of one of those freak things where, you know, Hey, we need to kind of try and find a spark in, in the OU Texas game and let's put Caleb in and see what he can do here. And, you know, kind of the rest is history and he never, he never gets it back there. Um, kind of a freak deal. I, I think, you know, I think Spencer would have had a fantastic career at OU. Um, again, being the guy to follow up three dudes is, is a, is a tough ask, especially for a young guy. Um, but came in, he played good football. He's a really good football player. Um, he is in it. He's got some mobility. Um, but I think you know. I, I, I want to interject there because I think it's unique. Um, if Caleb wasn't behind Spencer, I think Spencer plays better. I think he got a little bit of the case of looking over his shoulder. Everybody was talking about the talent that Caleb had. And even in the locker room, it, it had to have been known like, okay, if, if, if worse comes to worse or we need a spark, Caleb's going to go in because he's, you know, he's ready for it. And unfortunately, I think that got to Spencer. And so when it happened and Caleb rose to the occasion, it was like, golly, what a horrible place to be in mentally. Um, right. And, and that's, that's part of the battle that goes on a quarterback's head that a lot of people don't see is like, you got to get out of your own way sometimes and you got to stay confident in yourself because you are a great player, but there's so much pressure on you and there's so much pressure to win that you've got to go out there and perform. And if you start to look over your shoulder or worry about the next guy or worry about this play or that play, man, you're just not going to play good enough football. And at a place like Oklahoma, the next guy's going to come in and take them and make the most of his opportunity, which is what happened. Um, let me touch on Caleb real quick. I think Caleb's phenomenal. I think uh, completely different in personality than a lot of these guys, but also the same in a lot of respects. I think he respects the game, um, which I appreciate about him a lot. He just respects, you know, the, the 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 history of the game of football, and I know that's pretty broad. But he was brought up in a household where, you know, it was, hey, you gotta you gotta figure out what it takes to be great. And I think his parents have put him in the position to be great. But something that he has, he just has a ridiculous amount of talent. His arm talent is insane. He can run. Um, he's got confidence. Uh, it's a, it's a different type of confidence. Obviously, paints his nails and all those things and teach their own there. But um, I think the guy is just one of those generational type of people that, um, you know, when surrounded by good players, he does have the ability to infect a locker room in a positive way, um, to be a leader on and off the field, and to go and make incredible plays. And so you think about that one, too. If he stays in the Crimson and Cream his whole tenure, who knows what would have happened, right? Mm -hmm. I, I personally think it was a detriment for him to go out to USC just with, you know, you just had a lack of, of foundation out there. Lincoln's trying to become the new head guy. It's the West Coast. You're having to, you know, try and fit in, so on and so forth. So I think that was somewhat of a detriment to him. However, he obviously played some great football. They didn't. They weren't as successful as he or they wanted to be during his tenure there. But he he showed all the attributes that uh, could potentially land him a massive you know rookie deal here in in the coming weeks. So mm -hmm. I thought Caleb and, and Spencer both were phenomenal. Um, talk about Dylan for a second, Con. I love Dylan Gabriel. I think Dylan Gabriel was phenomenal for us. And I don't know why so many people, maybe not Oklahoma folks, because we all appreciate him, but outside of, you know, the locker room and in our fan base, people are like, this guy sucks, this guy sucks, this guy sucks. I'm like, no, he doesn't. He's an incredible distributor of the football. He's a great leader. He did so much stuff in the offseason to, to rally the guys around him. And the guy has just been a touchdown machine. I think he's above average in accuracy. And he just makes the guys around him better. And, and I think for the last couple of seasons in Norman, he has been phenomenal with so much change and the coaching change and so on and so forth. He has done a exceedingly well job, uh, a good job leading this offense and leading this program. What, 
what are your thoughts on on DG, Con? Yeah, I mean, the guy's been playing football, I think, since I was in fourth grade, been playing college football for that long. I mean, he was at um, UCF forever. Um, I mean, he, he's still playing this next year. I mean, Oregon has to be licking their chops. They lose a first round draft pick in Bo Nix. And then you get a six year guy walking in with just, I mean, the most experience out of any transfer portal quarterback ever up to this point. I mean, he's, he's already top 10, I think in passing yards in NCAA history. He's just going to keep climbing that board this year. This guy, and when he came to OU had so much experience at playing in, you know, big football games. And that's something that, you know, I will we'll get into Jackson a little bit, but something that I kind of am excited about about Jackson is being able to sit behind a guy like that for a year. I know he, I think recently talked about, you know, it sucks being on the sideline. You want to be the starter out there, but gosh, getting to learn from a guy like Dylan Gabriel, who's done it year after year after year, put up big numbers, won a bunch of football games. I mean, that's, it's, it's about, it's, something that you can't put a price tag on there. I mean, yeah. just the experience that, that hopefully Dylan was able to pass a few things along to Jackson, you know, just kind of the way he handles himself, the way he prepares, things like that, the way he leads uh, a team. Hopefully, you know, Jackson got a few of those things because, you know, when, when you play football for six years in college, you, you kind of start figuring things out uh, pretty quick. <laughs> No doubt. I think the, the maturation process is huge, and it's it's hard to come in and, and be a day one starter at quarterback in, in this league and at this level. And guys are doing it nowadays at a high level, but it's not easy. And so I think he has and will benefit in a massive way from this past season. And then, you know, yeah, he obviously got to start the bowl game. So I'm a huge fan of DG, but let's move into Jackson Arnold. I just mentioned he got to start the bowl game this last year. Connor, you and I were there in person and watched it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, some turnovers, and, and, and it didn't end up on the scoreboard the way that we wanted it to. But um, what do you think of, of Jackson? He's obviously a generational talent, uh, straight out of Denton Geyer, right? Um, he's got all the tools. And it was baffling to me when I kept hearing people say, hey, the reason Dylan's leaving isn't because Levy's out. It isn't because this or that. It's because Jackson Arnold. So you're sitting here talking about the consensus all Big 12 quarterback in Dylan Gabriel deciding to leave and go to Oregon because we've got a guy in, in Jackson Arnold that's that much better. So talk a little bit about what you've seen out of, out of Jackson and what you're excited to see out of him. Yeah, as far as, you know, the reason Dylan left, I – you know, we, we'll probably never know. I don't know if he'll ever come out and say exactly why, but I mean, everyone can assume it's because there's this young freak behind him that, you know, is he's going to get handed the keys to the castle and, you know, it's kind of move on or, or kind of get run over in that situation. But, you know, I mean, since his first game, he came in against, uh, it was one of our early season opponents completed 11 of 11 passes for a touchdown, ran for another one. Oh, hey. Hey, that's hard to do. <laughs> Trust me, I know that is extremely hard to do. It doesn't matter who you're playing. I don't. I don't care if it's you know Alabama or whoever we were playing early in the season. You know, it's it's tough to come into a college football game, especially as what a probably 18 year old kid, and and put up numbers like that. You know, got played in six games this last year, I believe. So got a bunch of really good playing time. Got to play the whole second half um, up at BYU which was a close game. He, you know, kind of first experience, you know, on the road. Um, and then the bowl game, I mean, showed a lot of really good things, you know, through the ball. He's got some zip. He's definitely has arm talent. I think everybody who watches him can see that through a bunch of really good balls. Um, you know, I think of the one in kind of the back corner of the end zone where he kind of threaded it in, you know, we had a toe tap touchdown there. Um, but yeah, the the intangibles as far as you know what you want in a quarterback, he seems he seems to have those. And you know, it's kind of this off season um, for him, especially spring ball. It's you know the things we've been talking about. It's you know Dylan's moved on. Get that locker room um, to you know kind of rally around him. He's got to be 
you know, the, the player's player. He's got to be that guy. He's got to be that emotional leader on the field, off the field. He's got to set the example for all the other guys. Um, Cause you know, he's, he's not the oldest guy in the room um, by any means. we got some older quarterbacks on the roster, but you know, he's got to, he's got to put those pants on um, and, and lead the team. Um, so you, you talk about, you know, kind of what you've seen from him, um, things you like, um, and again, things you kind of want to see coming out of this spring. Yeah. Well, let me, so I've got a list here. Um, and this applies to everybody we've talked about today, the intangibles, and this is not a exhaustive list. This is just a list that I put down of what I think that all these guys that we talked about, and then also Jackson embody to some degree that allows them to be great. And they're in no particular order, but I'm just going to go through them. And I'll say check if I think it's a home run that Jackson has. And then we can talk about it if we don't think he's quite there yet or we just don't know because we haven't had enough time. So first and foremost, natural talent and natural leadership. I think obviously we mentioned it. Natural talent, the guy's got all the natural talent in the world. He was unbelievable at Denton Geyer. He's got, you know, the, the tools that, that he needs to be successful from an arm strength standpoint, can put touch on the ball, can run a little bit. He's got size. He's got stature. He's got pocket presence. Um, he, he's, he's got all that. From a leadership standpoint, what you mentioned, Connor, we can only hope that that's what he's doing right now. So I, I'll give that one a check. Next is confidence. I think confidence is the biggest attribute as a quarterback. And all the great ones that I've been around, all these guys we've talked about, the Johnny Manzels of the world, uh, so on and so forth. When you see those guys and their cleats pass over that sideline, that white line onto the field of play, they believe that they're the best player on the field. And they go act like it and they make everybody around them better. I see that in Jackson and that will continue to improve. So check there. Accuracy, you mentioned it, 11 of 11 when he came in as a true freshman. Um, he, uh, he throws a very accurate ball. Check there. Pocket presence, I mentioned it. This gets better with maturity in college football, right? I think he already is very good in that, in that department. Um, he's got size, so he can withstand getting bumped around a little bit. But, you know, moving in the pocket and still being able to keep your eyes down the field and deliver the ball – I think he does have that. So check there. Infectious. We talked about Baker a lot in this department. Is he infectious? Or his habits infectious? Is the way that he plays infectious? Is he going to get involved in the crowd? I think some of the greatest players out there, they have a way of just getting the crowd involved and getting a, uh, you know, a stadium full of 80 to 100,000 people fired up. So I'll leave that one as a to be determined, but I think he has the ability to do so. And then finally, even keeled and battle tested. You mentioned the BYU game. I think he was battle tested there and he stayed very even keel. Um, I, I think that he's got great demeanor about him. We use that word a lot in the QB room, having great demeanor. Um, man, I, I think he's got, got all these tools that I have written down. I know there are some other things that I missed, but – those are some of the qualities that you look for in a quarterback and especially a great quarterback. Yep. So, Con, any final thoughts on the QBs or even Jackson uh, before we close up for the night? No, I, just one thing you were talking about, you know, battle tested. And uh, beginning of next season, I think we start with four straight at home. Um, so I, I don't have it in front of me, our first road game. But, you know, he's going to get pretty comfortable in the Palace there to start those first four games when it's, 105 degrees or whatever, but you know, I'm excited for that fifth one, wherever we're at going on the road, um, kind of see what he's all about, um, going into somebody else's place. So it's going to be, it's going to be a fun one to watch, but you know, right now all we can do is I've been watching all the Instagram videos that OU football accounts been putting out. And I mean, those videos will make you think that we're winning it all. We're going undefeated unscored on. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm drinking all the cool, all the, uh, content Kool Aid right now from the the social media department that, that that they're throwing out. So I'm excited. It's gonna be fun. I love it. I love it. I um I, I'm with you. I I think that if you watch some of those videos, you're gonna think that uh, that we're gonna go win it all. And I hope we do. First year in the SEC. It's gonna be incredible. Uh, so with that, another episode of the Dial It Up Pod talking about QBs. 
We're going to move through each position group, talk about some of the guys, but also just what it takes to be great at that position. So as always, uh, listen to wherever you listen to your podcast, um, interact with us on social media. Uh, we will get some Q&A going with the crowd uh, here at some point. But follow along each week um, at Red Dirt Media Co. on social media. And um, as always, I'm your host, Trevor Knight, along with my co-host, Mr. Connor Knight, ongoing. Another episode of the Dial It Up podcast with Trevor and Connor Knight. See you next week. Boomer Sooner. Soon.